the Department of Labor in our third week, third day of committee activity. It's like the third week already. Um, Commissioner Harrington, it's great to have you and your team. Uh, you. Welcome back in person. I think it's also been a while since we've had a chance to do that. I think uh, the three of you know most of us. Uh, you may or may not know uh, Senator Harrison. So I don't know if Senator Harrison might introduce yourself. Sure. Quickly. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, representing Wyndham County. I live in Brattleboro. Um, happy to be here. <laughs> and we have Senator Brock and Senator Cummings, who are not necessarily early birds, uh, but I'm sure they'll be in here any minute. Yeah, not a problem. So uh, if you're. The only other context yeah, I wanted to add for uh, those who are here is. Um, we did receive a letter from Vermont Legal Aid with their comments on progress made with the Department of Labor. I told the commissioner he could uh, choose how much or how little he wanted to address that. I think things like the IT system, I think we have questions about anyway progress there, but we can save that for a more in-depth discussion when you have a, a written response or if you want to address it in the hour that you have. So uh, for the record, Michael Harrington, uh, Commissioner for the Department of Labor. Um, happy to be back. It's nice to be in person. So thank you. Um, it's good to have you. Thank you. Um, Hello. Hello. I'm sorry. I got no, not a, not a problem. Not a problem. Not a problem. So uh, we're just doing introductions. So you didn't miss anything yet. Um, uh, I've been with the department since 2017, first as the deputy commissioner, uh, then as the interim commissioner, and then was uh, permanently appointed in June of 2020. Uh, and uh, with me today, I have uh, Cameron Wood, uh, who you may uh, know uh, as our unemployment insurance director. Um, he also is now serving as our uh, policy and legislative affairs director. So um, it, he'll retain both of those titles from a political appointment perspective, um, but we do have an associate director of UI who has been uh, in UI for a long time, um, and she runs the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, I also have Matt uh, Barowitz with us, who I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and if you're not, you will uh, become very familiar with Matt uh, over the coming weeks. Um, Matt is our chief economist, but also runs our labor market and economic development uh, division in terms of uh, overseeing jobs data and occupational data. Um, so you'll uh, you'll hear from him probably numerous times. Um, and then just for the sake of time, uh, knowing that there may be a lot that the committee itself wants to cover or questions that people have. So. I'm happy to give a quick rundown. Uh, a couple of things I was gonna highlight will, I think, um, touch on uh, aspects that Legal Aid had in their letter. Um, so we can address some of those as well. Um, and then if we wanna jump into questions, we can do that. Great, so um, first off, I'll just start um, by passing this around. Uh, I've got more copies if you want to know, but um, this, uh, just gives a quick rundown of the department. I figured a one sheet from maybe the new members. Um, it gives our four divisions. It also highlights the wage and hour unit, which is um, a statutory um, uh, program that uh, I think is uh, critical. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so one's on cardstock. I just did. Some, I get the fancy one. Yeah. Got the fancy one. Um, and and then it gives a again as most of you are very familiar, but um, it just gives a very high level of the department. Um, the department. Uh, sits uh, at the cabinet level uh, with the governor, like many other agencies and, and other departments. Um, we operate our workforce development division, our unemployment insurance program, uh, the labor market information division, workers' compensation and safety. And under safety is, are things like BOSHA, Project WorkSafe, uh, Passenger Tramway. Um, and then again, I highlighted the wage and hour unit because they're really charged with um, uh, labor protections uh, under the law uh, for employees, um, especially around uh, unpaid wages predominantly. Um, it gives a breakdown of our funding in terms of a uh, uh, look at how much we receive in, in federal versus general fund, special fund, and interdepartmental fund funding. Um, obviously, we've been predominantly federally funded uh, for a long time. 
Um, I will say that there has been a recent shift in that breakdown just in the past two years, as you can imagine. Um, so I would say our percentage at one point was as high as you know 85 to 86 percent federally funded. Um, you can see that that has changed, uh, and that's predominantly because during the pandemic. There were additional funds through the general fund that were allocated to the department to cover some operational components as well as some additional funds for um, ongoing workforce uh, development efforts. Um, and then uh, the, the statewide map there on the bottom left just shows the fact that we have a number of regional offices around the state. The green ones are essentially what we consider our, our hub locations. Um, so uh, again, they, they cover um, all of the state and then we've had some small satellite uh, locations. Those aren't always marked with a physical space most of the time they are, but sometimes it's a partnership we have uh, where we uh, have staff there on a regular basis, but it might be a space we share with CCV or, a, or work out of a library or something like that. But there are, those are the communities or areas where we provide uh, direct services. So, Michael, uh, there's a huge desert here in uh, Springfield and White River Junction where I, uh, but we had hubs. Yeah, I mean, so this is a, a general representation. We don't have a hub there, we have offices there. So we have a Springfield office, we have a White River Junction office. The R White River Junction office literally has, you know, for as long as I've known with the department, only had two staff people in it. Yeah, that's um, so when, and we have a rule that we don't have people staff in office by themselves. Um, so the, uh, in most cases, you get one call out that closes an office for a day and we shift staff around. So um, we, again, are looking at other ways that we can maybe not own, you know, operate in our own siloed office, but be partnered with another organization or institution in that area. So then we don't have to worry about one person calling out and having to close an office. Do you have a good example of that? Uh, like where we have partnered yeah. sometimes so what we've been looking at for a little while has been partnering with folk rehab because we serve some of the same right. uh, okay. individuals um, so it's uh, in Bennington Vermont um, where it is one of our larger offices but we do share a space with folk rehab uh, and um, so it's a it's been a great um, tag team effort um, because we're able to share resources and supports and make sure that there's more continuity um, when the client comes in. Um, but then we're also looking at, um, in Springfield at one point, we, for a long time, we're not in a, a state office building. We had looked to move to potentially a state office building, but also looking for uh, space uh, with CCB, right? So again, um, that would be another potential type of partner. But right now they're in the state office building, aren't they? They are, we are not. Uh, so, so we're in a Springfield office. We had, again, more. So what ends up happening is, and I didn't put it on this sheet, but I'm assuming most agencies and departments are struggling with the same thing based on what I've heard. I mean, we run anywhere between a 20 to 30% vacancy rate at any given time. So coming out of the pandemic, we were just decimated. It's a lot of turnover, a lot of churn. Matt can talk about what that looks like at the statewide level. Wait, um, I think all of us have heard it. Yeah, so, I, so part of what we're running into is how do we keep these offices open and running with the limited staff we have. So um, Springfield is one of those where it can be open uh, and then it could easily, you know, if we've got a couple people out on FMLA and we've got one person out who calls in sick, that may close the office and then we have to shift staff around. They either work remote, like telework, or they might uh, go from the Springfield office down to the Brattleboro office for the day mm -hmm. and work out of the Brattleboro office. So uh, if I could just follow up on this, this map isn't to represent, because one of the things we'll get to at some point is our one stop, our, our, yep. our one stop, this whole notion of going to one place regionally right. where you have Work, workforce development help you yep. get UI help you get anything that touched the department like, and those are not these correct so I mean we are we have one federally certified one stop and that's our Burlington right. office I will also tell you um, our <coughs> foot traffic like literally dropped through the floor yeah. after oh, the pandemic yeah. um, so again a lot of these uh, so what we've been trying to do is um, it's really been a shift of philosophy where staff have 
traditionally been able to sit in the office, open the door, and our clients come to us. Uh, and we have changed our methodology. So we have certain uh, days and hours when they can walk in, but often our staff are out in the community trying to find clients. So they're working with other partner agencies. Um, they might be, uh, we have what we call labor on location. So they might go to a library or um, another place where there are um, a, a grouping of client, potential clients. Um, and then we're also doing more um, direct outreach. So you probably saw last year, like we had um, some of our job fairs and outreaches were at um, baseball games across the state. Um, so you get 4,000 people going to uh, a baseball game in Burlington. We are now um, able to at least shake hands with most of those people and try to see if we can provide direct services. Are you, are you tracking? metrics of success maybe that's a question. yeah so again it's a question of what is success so we do yeah. track like how many people attend a job fair how uh -huh. many employers attend we have rough numbers on like how many hires came out of a job yeah. fair um, we do uh, most of our program and i was going to get to this but okay. the, the challenge we run into is that uh, right now workforce development um, there's all the things we would like to do, and then there's what we're required to do under yes. the federal government. And so what we end up struggling with is like new initiatives, innovative thinking, they don't always fit into the federal box uh, that they like to put us in. So, um, you know, we have uh, a number of metrics we track for the federal government for the US Department of Labor. Um, and uh, so most of our funding is all based on enrollment in programs. So it's not just enough to have a connection with somebody, we have to try to get them enrolled. Um, and you hate to boil it down to, to numbers and dollars when you're talking about people, um, but that's where most of our federal funding for workforce development comes from is through enrollments in our programs. I mean, numbers are helpful too, right? Yes. I mean, I, yeah. I think if the numbers I heard yeah. are correct, we have 24,000 open jobs in the state. Yeah. And, you know, are you coordinating across other agencies to really tackle that number sector by sector right we, now? We are, I mean, I would say it's a little bifurcated just because, you know, programs get designed based on where the money is and where the resources are. So it's not as um, maybe graded or uh, yeah. interlocked as we would like. Um, I think the, the State Workforce Development Board is a key key role in convening those partners and talking about statewide strategies. And I'm looking at Senator Clarkson because she sits on the board. Yeah, but as, uh, yeah, we, as, we, as we only meet quarterly, it's a, yeah. sort of a little. Yeah, uh, and I think there's a, a desire to make um, the board, again, much more of a driver around identifying uh, priority sectors, uh, identifying uh, kind of a, a uniform or cohesive approach to how we tackle um, uh, getting people into jobs in particular sectors. Again, our enrollments, um, like many, are very low because the number of people who actually need services is very low. Um, it, Actually, when you the look number of people who need services statewide in terms of everything that we know people need services on is high. Well, again, I mean, when we talk about health to travel sure, to all sure. that. But so when we talk about jobs and joblessness, you know, the number of unemployed Vermonters and the number of unemployed Vermonters collecting benefits is historically low. Well. Yes. Um, and so that that is true. Yeah. That, but that service, but not services as I think we all Correct. Think yeah. I'm, and I was thinking more about job seekers looking for jobs. Right. And right. Similar. To, to follow up on her 24,000, how many are on UI at the moment? Uh, currently, I'm going to break it. How many um, are what? So, on UI, on so just to, I'll, I'll throw a caveat out there because I like to help Matt out here. So there's a, a misnomer or misconception. There's the number of people who are unemployed, and that makes up our unemployment rate in the state. Yes. So the current right. number of unemployed Vermonters is 8,000, 8,400. 8, and the number of people actually collecting benefits does not play into right. the unemployment rate. So the number of people collecting benefits is 4,000. Um, so uh, again, it's about half the number of the, a uh, little less than half the number of the actual number of unemployed Vermonters. It is, um, this is our busiest season in UI, uh, November through March, um, because of seasonal layoffs. Um, and most companies 
decide to downsize if they're going to downsize during that period as well. Um, but also, just so for context, 4,000 is actually um, below our average for this time of year. So in a traditional non-pandemic year, it wouldn't be uncommon to see roughly 6,000 people on okay. our offense. Senator Robert. I've seen various statistics on the number of folks who have left the workforce mm -hmm. over time, ranging from 24 to 48,000. Where did they go? So I'll do my best to represent Matt, but I'm gonna ask Matt to come up here. Um, the, the number one contributing factor is they aged out of the workforce in one shape or another. Most of them were beyond retirement age, so they were staying because they loved their job. It was easy to, to and when it became complicated with the pandemic, they used that opportunity to exit the workforce. Some are, many were at retirement age and many were close to retirement age and a lot of places also looked um, from a financial perspective offered early retirement. So there are many other factors. I'll let Matt jump in, but most of it is around um, retirements. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, Matt Gerwitz, uh, Director of Economic Labor Market Information with the Vermont Department of Labor. Uh, right now, uh, relative to before the pandemic, our labor force is about 20,000 people less than where it was. Um, so we have recovered. Uh, for a while, we were 30,000 down. Um, but uh, we did see uh, some positive uh, re-entrance back into the labor force over 2022. At least that's what our best information is. Um, I've seen national studies that estimate uh, about 75% of the labor force contraction is related specifically to demographics. So if you line up the baby boomer generation against the calendar, the leading edge of the baby boomer turned 65 in 2011. That means the leading edge of the baby boomers turned 75 in 2021. Um, and uh, you know, if I had some nice pictures and graphs, I could point where yeah. you can see you can see this like this trend that happens because the recession that happened in 2007 was a bad one, right? Where housing prices, stock prices, they all went in the tank. And if you were planning on retiring, then you'd say, "Whoa, this isn't a good time. I'm going to stay in the labor force." So, 2009, 10, we actually had this kind of like pent up demand for retirements until the economy improved. However, this recession, housing prices, asset prices, stock portfolios through the roof. So if you were close to retirement now, a lot of people said, this is gonna be my exit, you know? And so, um, though we focus on demographics a lot as it relates to labor force, I think it's really important to kind of look at that kind of grab bag of catch-all concepts that make up the other portions. And what we're seeing is that a lot of times that is people with less than a college education, um, so uh, that's a population that typically gets hard, hit hardest during economic downturns, and that is one of the populations that really hasn't recovered or returned to labor force. So when we talk about downward pressure and labor force outside of demographics, that's a population to really zoom in on. And that uh, can present itself in a number of different uh, socioeconomic characteristics, race, ethnicity as well, but particularly people less than a four-year college education. Um, there are other... Um, indications that some people have gone down to uh, one income earner instead of two uh, in the household. Um, uh, but, you know, I think from, a, from just a, a big statement, I really look at the people with less than a college education. That's where they're showing a tremendous amount of, um, that they haven't returned to the labor force as they were pre-pandemic. Well, one of the major issues uh, that I think is a concern of this committee is how do we replenish the labor force and that i know is a direct function of the department of labor but i'm wondering if the department has any thoughts along those lines so uh, it's it's definitely going to be a joint effort i there's the i think the traditional we need to make sure we're training and retaining those folks uh, moving through high school coming out of college um, so there's a, a big effort on making sure we've got the right training programs in place um, to make sure we have the skills for to meet our employer needs. There's the, the marketing and recruitment aspect. So some of that is with us. Most of it is at the uh, Agency of Commerce when we talk about like outward marketing and recruitment of people or incentivizing people to move to our state, which you've heard the governor talk about yeah. as well. well um, this committee is pioneer. Yes, um, it, correct. It came out of this committee, the, the relocation incentive program, right? So, um, and, and a number of others. So looking at untapped markets of, of individuals. So um, I'm, I'm curious, and I haven't really had a deep conversation with Matt about this either, but 
eventually we'll see some correction probably coming through this whenever this next next economic downturn occurs um, the number of available jobs or businesses looking to grow may contract as well um, just based on historical knowledge so the demand will be for workers will be less that's not a solution but I think we're keeping a close eye on that so um, I think again it's making sure that people who are here stay here uh, and then making sure that we're also re replenishing or I, I attribute it or equate it to um, a leaky bucket right so what are the factors that are causing people to leave the workforce so it also may be other um, challenges I'm you know I'm sure we'll talk a lot in here about things like child care and other barriers that prevent people housing that prevent people from either relocating to Vermont or prevent them from uh, returning to the Workforce, right? I, I have no doubt that some of the folks Matt talks about in terms of where they've gone to a single income household is because one of the um, uh, wage earners uh, needed to make a very difficult decision to leave the workforce in order to care for a loved one, care for a child, because they couldn't either find child care or couldn't afford child care. Is there, and I feel like we always just want Matt to stay in our room all the time, but um, you know. I, anyone can answer this question. Are there things that make Vermont's uh, labor issues unique in the rest of the country? It sounds like this sped up the demographic shift nationally. Everyone's struggling with childcare and housing, but are we a unique outlier in any of those areas or providers? That's a great question, and I'm not 100% sure on that. I've tried to do some thinking on this. What makes this economic recovery from the COVID recession uh, so different is that the competition for labor is really heightened across the country. Yes. And um, even like, as opposed to what was happening in 2007 through 2010, where it was like all urban, it was urban based economic recovery and the rural parts of the country were hollowing themselves out as everyone migrated into urban settings for opportunities. We're not seeing that in this last economic downturn. And so it is just like carte blanche. And I think what, what changes it is that now, I think a lot more states are in tune with it. And so the competition for labor is not just like, you know, it's not just Vermont trying to recruit people from California. It's like the other 48 states trying to recruit people from California in addition to Vermont. Uh, and also the, the international climate is very different. So yeah. historically, the answer for the United States has been we're gonna change our immigration policies, we're gonna welcome in new workers. The US for many people is no longer the primary destination of choice. And we're seeing that Canada is taking um, measures right now um, saying that, you know, we're, you know, uh, we're going to prevent people from out of the country buying houses in Canada. Mm -hmm. So, like, what I'm hearing is the latest news. So, you know, so it is going to be interesting to see. But I don't think there's uh, someone makes it more different. I two things that I've heard. One is we certainly went into the pandemic with an older workforce. Yes. Um, so that made us more susceptible, yeah. I think, to yes. uh, to the challenge of the pandemic. It also makes it harder for us to recover because many of those people aren't coming back to the workforce mm -hmm. after the pandemic. The other issue, the other thing that's pretty unique to Vermont that I've heard, and this is just anecdotal from my counterparts in other states, many other states are having to um, incentivize people to go back to work, right? So they left the workforce um, and they're still at prime working age uh, and they are having a hard time returning to the workforce. We know from our numbers that that's not the case here. I mean, certainly there are people who are, who are always trying to re-employ, but when you look at other states, our, our unemployment rate is extremely low. The number of people, like, they're having to think of incentives not to get people to relocate, just to go back to work. Yeah. Um, and we have not necessarily had that same situation. So Maine, as we know, has a similar demographic. How much, Matt, do you work with the Maine numbers? Because they would be interesting to compare uh, to go to Keisha's question about, you know, um, uh, you know, who, who would, you know, are they having a similar, I, my guess is they have, it's almost exactly the same picture. Is that 100%. Uh, I just co-presented with the LMI director in the state of Maine. Uh, CCB put together a New England based mm -hmm. forum. And so I invited Maine and Connecticut. Uh, so the three of us co-presented all together. And uh, looking at Maine's statistics, it's fascinating because uh, you know, I can speak and interchange me yeah. in Vermont, where our labor force participation rate used to be very high in, in Vermont. We right. used to talk about it all the time. We had a highly educated population. Our labor force participation was high, higher than the U.S. COVID happens, it drops down significantly. 
and then it just kind of like slowly climbed back, but basically plateaued. The growth is no longer happening. And Maine is the same. Most states like New Hampshire and other states, they actually, they're continuing to see a rise, even though they might not be back to where they were pre-pandemic as far as labor force participation. But Maine is that same where it just looks, you know, very static as far as labor force participation is concerned. Uh, again, demographically, uh, race and ethnicity, age, uh, very similar population. Yeah, they're so interesting that in Connecticut how's Connecticut doing they're, they're a little different as far as a New England state um, they have always been kind of an odd uh, state I've never really got my hands around Connecticut's economy um, they well half large... of it skews to New York and half yes. of centered in Connecticut and they have some large like defense contractors is my understanding mm -hmm. in there which can yeah. really boom and bust them based on who gets contracts right speaking of immigration we're hearing from newer parts of Vermont that have accepted Afghan refugees, but they want more of that. You know, now they have the systems in place, they're not as a Brattleboro, oh, it's a great example. Mm -hmm. Are you all participating in more kind of refugee resettlement oriented labor? So we took a, a pretty heavy role in the last year, year and a half. So we actually have um, a foreign labor program manager uh, within oh, okay. the workforce development division. Um, and we've uh, assisted both Brattleboro, um, and I'm, n I'm never going to remember the, the acronyms, but there's one in the Chittenden County area, there's one in Brattleboro, and then Brattleboro is also helping Vermont, yes. uh, or for Bennington, uh, which I'm from Bennington, so my mom was actually uh, one of the individuals that was helping uh, with the resettlement of some of the Afghan refugees. Um, so that actually gave me a very unique perspective into the challenges they were facing. Um, so we, we've we given um, some uh, significant funding to like the Brattleboro uh, Development Credit Corporation, um, as well as the associate, the organization that's in the Chittenden. So we are involved. It's interesting because um, there is a certain number of benefits uh, and entitlements they receive um, from the federal government um, through um, the that comes out of the, the office, uh, the relocation office at the Agency of Human Services here. So they're entitled to a certain amount of benefits um, first, and they have to use those benefits first before they um, shift to using like our WIOA benefits. But some of the like items that we're able to help with are probably pretty unique to these types of populations. So obviously things like translation services is one, a big one, but we can also help. So if for instance, this was a new one to me, you know, if someone is looking um, to become employed um, and they need um, uh, dentures, right, we can actually help cover part of the cost for them to actually go see a healthcare uh, uh, professional to, um, to receive, you know, dentures or something like um, professional clothing, right? So if they are doing interviews and they need new professional clothing, we can help. And that's uh, all federal. Right? Well, it comes through our WIOA program. Because we start program. reporting dentures for the rest of our population. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are, but again, I'm that. Did somebody get it? Did yeah. Yeah. I'm so, thrilled somebody's getting it. Just, <laughs> so it all, but it all comes out of like, they get a certain amount allotment of, of funds and, and benefits when they transition here and then when those yeah. run out then we're able to help with you know things like um, if they're going through a training program and they need um, to acquire their own tool set like right. we can help cover the cost of tools things like that's that so, nature. so and, and how about training oh training too yeah, uh, that's, a, yeah. say, that's one of the big pluses yeah, so that's a obvious i was kind of counting that as an obvious one but probably i shouldn't yeah. have assumed that but things like on the job training um apprenticeships is a big one um uh Work ex other work experience or work-based learning um, uh, efforts. Uh, there certainly the, the challenge has been really um, the the limited uh, language uh, proficiency. Yeah. So there's a big barrier there, and the um, lack of translators. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like there's already the the the, the, the um, the gap, and then we don't have enough resources to fill the gap. Um, the uh, the other one we see are things like uh, needing to learn how to drive right. and, um, so they can get to work, right? Because there isn't always public transportation available. But what we, so uh, a unique service that we can also work with and uh, provide some funding for is if there's a, 
you know, like if there's a group of um, new Americans working out of a single employer and they all tend to live in the same area, we can actually help with coordinating um, regular work transportation for them. So we can't do one-offs, but like let's say there were uh, 10 or 15 people living in a housing complex that all work for the same employer, we could then work on uh, providing transportation. Yeah, that's great, and I'm, I'm familiar with those programs yeah. in, in Broadway, and it really made a difference. And there was something that expired uh, at the end of December, so I don't know if that was the uh, program that you yeah, were Yeah, I don't funding. know if it was through us or not. It, that's it really may important. have been on human services, too. But. Right, and just in public transportation, a, a nice thing about this is, is that if we are able to provide uh, services to the new Americans, then the existing people can also ride that. So yep. it, it helps them yep. um, just meet people and yep. it helps the employers too. Is, is there ever a situation where you get funding from the employers to help not, sponsor that? Not to us directly. So typically we're we'll the program. Gets it, yeah, so we don't receive funding from employers. Um, employers invest through things like apprenticeship programs. The big thing for us is there has to be a job at the end of the mm -hmm. tunnel. Right, so a lot of people like to offer work experience or some type of life experience, but there's no guaranteed job at the end. So it's really important for us and our federal programs that if you're going to have a work experience, that there's a job waiting for the individual right. at the end. Right. Um, and that's the key around apprenticeship, right. right? So they actually are an apprentice with an employer and um, there's actually a, a, also a, a wage and career ladder that has to occur at the end. So they go through their hours, they graduate from the program, program and they might automatically go from $14 an hour to $16 an hour or you know, something like that. So there has to be a wage progression upon completion and there has to be an employment uh, after the completion. Okay, and that's to use your federal dollars? Uh, federal that... and state. So the okay. state does fund um, some of our apprenticeship work uh, and then there's also federal apprenticeship dollars as well. We talk a lot about upskilling and training, but I keep hearing again and again really basic skills, ELL, and driver's ed are huge stumbling blocks and they seem to fall through the cracks of a lot of different jurisdictions. We heard about foster kids and they can't get driver's ed through agency of education. Right. They need a car from a AHS to yeah. make this work. Are there any things like that where if we put a small one-time fund in to get a car or to jumpstart an ELL program, we could... It'd probably be worth a, a bigger conversation, but it highlights um, what I was talking about, which is we're really we're really handicapped um, because so much of our workforce development staff, and we've had this conversation with um, Chair Marcotte as well, yeah. it, because you have to, it has to fit within the box of what the federal expectations are of the program, right. which really does not leave much room for creative thinking. Um, and if you can imagine, the federal government doesn't focus a lot on creative thinking. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it's just big. It's big. It is big. Um, and so that's, I think those are the opportunities where we can find funding or even additional um, resources so that we can provide that assistance, yeah. right? So like, again, 80, 80 something per 82% of our workforce development division is federally funded. So when you think about the fact that there's really only, you know, 18% of the funds are actually, um, state. you know, state, that, that also means only 18% uh, our staff or staff time can actually go towards statewide initiatives. So that's where we've talked a lot with other committees and, and probably this one as well in the past about how do we make ourselves more nimble uh, yeah. and ability to meet Vermont's needs as opposed to what the federal government determines. We're clear on that. Sarah's big for Yes, yes, yeah. Um, and so I'm at Sarah Buxton is our workforce development um, director. She's um, a, pri a former legislator, uh, and that she'll be before this committee, I'm sure, numerous times. Um, so happy to have her come in to talk in more detail. Do you want um, me to hit on anything else before or keep do you, going? Do you want to do IT before we? Sure. Yeah. I think what I want to just hit on is um, when I look across the department when we talk about priorities, um, a big one is modernization. We all think of UI, but the Department of Labor is actually going through four major modernization efforts. Um, so UI is our largest. We're in the middle of modernizing our workers' compensation uh, system. 
we're modern. We're also in the middle of modernizing our workforce development system. Uh, and these are IT systems. Okay. And then um, we're also uh, working through the agency of administration to upgrade our, um, we have to have a, a dual system in our um, accounting and fiscal office because of the federal requirements. So we have a program called FARS, which is like uh, federal accounting and reconciliation system or something like that um, and so we there's a massive amount of time that is spent chewing up the far system with the state's accounting system at the end of each quarter and the end of each year so we're actually the state's going through a modernization which means we're also trying to get on with that one system okay. um, so we have those four projects the the thing I'll say about modernization we actually will have a report coming to the legislature in the next week or two um, from myself and the secretary of the ADS. Um, I would say we're, we're on track. I know there's a concern from legal aid in the legal aid letter about our timing, but most large scale IT projects take anywhere from 12 to 18 months. In some cases, extremely large or complex programs can take two years or more to go through requirements gathering, drafting the RFP, putting out the RFP, going through selection, and then negotiating a contract. Um, so I know Legal Aid is concerned about the fact that in March we put out the RFP and it hasn't gone anywhere. That's not necessarily accurate. There's been a lot of work and negotiation that's been going on behind the scenes. So we have to go through and score what, in some cases, what was the largest um, uh, response we got? It was like Yeah, it was like 800,000 pages. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, the uh, for the record, Cameron Wood, I'm the Policy and Legislative Affairs Director for the Department, also the Unemployment Insurance Director. Uh, the largest RFP we got, I think, was close to 1,000 pages. Right, so there's a massive amount of review that has to happen. Um, one thing, and, and I think many are familiar, you know, unemployment insurance is probably right up there with healthcare when we talk about complexity because you're talking about eligibility. Um, and you're not just talking about eligibility once, you're talking about someone has to certify they're eligible for each week they receive benefits. Um, and so there's a, a whole number of federal um, checks and balances that have to happen. So, um, so we have put out the RFP, we've received uh, the proposals, we've gone through and reviewed and scored the proposals. We've gone back out to the top vendors to ask for what's known as a BAFO or best and final offer mm -hmm. uh, to see whether or not we can reduce some of the cost on those. Uh, and then we will come together and identify who we believe the top uh, vendor is. And that'll probably happen in the next month. Uh, the, the, the best and final offers are due back on January 19th. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say within the next two weeks or so following that, we'll make selection. And then we start the actual negotiation pro process on the agreement, which is going to, it's a $35 million project. Um, so it's gonna be an extensive um, contract negotiation. So again, I, we're, we're well within the time frame um, for contracting through the state, um, but um, it does take a long time. And then you're talking about um, probably another three years of, of development and launch after uh, the contract gets signed. Right. Um, and it, uh, I'm happy to come back and we talk about it another day, but um, so I'm, uh, I sit as the, uh, the chair elect for the National Association of State Workforce Agencies. Their priorities are workforce and uh, UI. Uh, and so they have a, a UI um, integrity center and data center. Um, so they do a lot with um, UI technology. Uh, so I've asked them, they're gonna provide me some of the maps that just illustrate the fact that, you know, before the pandemic, there might have been, you know, five to seven states at any given time looking to modernize their system. There's like something like 28 states in some way, shape or form are going through modernization right now. And there's, and there's like five legitimate vendors right? right so you know it's not like there's a sea of, of providers there's probably five legitimate vendors that have proven products on the market but given how long we have been on this modernization yes track, yeah we must be surely we must be one of the oldest IT systems in the country I mean uh, one of I've been trying to think of it's about those. 35 years old at this point oh well so the it uh, First went live in June seventh of nineteen 
we, we turned something like 50 in 2020 during the pandemic. Yeah, okay, um, so, so my, my point is, we should be at the top of the list. I realize we have very few vendors who yeah. can actually do this work, but surely, after discussing this for the 20 years I've been in the legislature, yep. the 19th, this is my 19th year, it, this has been on top of the docket for so long. Brandy, I, you know, is our, yeah. our I our I mean, I, I understand, we understand all well, those problems, but surely we must be at the top of this. But there is no list, right? So it's whoever's out of the gate and contracts with the vendor first. Right, well, the issue though, over there. Is, as I recall, the department came to the joint IT oversight yeah. committee with its planned timetable. We yeah. approved a, a certain amount of money to start yeah. with. Uh, where are you relative to what you told IT, uh, the uh, JTOC, that you'd be at this point. Yeah, I'd have to go back and because ADS is leading the project. They Senator really Harrison might not know what JTOC is. A Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee. Thank you. So I'll, I'll leave that to, to ADS. I will, one of the things that we decided to do, so at one point there was um, phase one money uh, that we got um, and the idea was to kick off phase one. We started going through that RFP process when we finished, when we were going through the RFP process, which again can take a while, we actually, the, the legislature also decided to fund the whole project, right? So that actually, instead of doing phases where we could end up with two vendors, um, we decided, and we decided one, we'll get more people to bid and probably a, a more competitive cost bid. So um, we reissued the RFP for the full, uh, I think the first round one was like 3.5 million. So we, we reissued the, the bid for um, 33.5. And so that we could compete with some of these larger states that are offering 40, 50, and $60 million to upgrade their, their systems. I, I mean, and if Wendy is a new member, because Anne and the rest of us, I mean, when you talk about how creative we can be and, 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 and the challenges the feds have, our creativity, quite honestly, as you know, has been hampered by our inability to have a, a modern IT yes, system. Yeah. So we have tried as you know, be fairly creative, particularly during the pandemic and now going forward, particularly about UI, but on, on many of the issues that touch I do. And our creativity has been hampered by. But there are many. Big time. Um, there are many checks and balances in the in the contracting process, right? And so some of them are, are state requirements. Some are um, requirements that have been put in by prior legislator legislatures. Um, so there are just we are probably shouldn't say this, but we are um, one of the more complex states when it comes to contracting. So we move exceptionally slow, um, and we have many hoops to jump through when we do large-scale contracting. I'm not saying that that's to our detriment. It probably saves us a lot of money in the end because we do um, a lot of checks and balances prior to contracting, but it slows us down. Uh, and well, so there are other concern, I think, more than anything else, is, the, is whether or not there is an appropriate sense yeah. of urgency yeah, uh, we know as we look at some of what happened during the pandemic that we've had some disasters and near disasters. Yeah. And, uh, there is a major concern that this is going to fall over on its side. It, so, I mean, I, there's no one who would love to see a more right. modern system than the people <laughs> at the Department of Labor. Right? Yeah. You know, um, but the so but I think I, our I, job I, is to keep the yes, fire lit. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, and and I totally respect and, and understand that. So. Um, so we're happy to come back and talk about that at any time. I would bring ADS and yes. agency. Well, I, I think it's worth doing. I, yeah. I think yeah. it's yeah. worth doing uh, because th yeah. this is such a critical system. Yeah. And we, we don't know if we're going to have another major yeah. problem like we had in the pandemic tomorrow. Right. And uh, will the department and its systems be able to react? Right. And is there at least one person still alive who knows <laughs> the code? Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There is one, one person. Well, there is one person. Save them. Uh, well, and, and, and they can't retire. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know this, and, and I'm more sharing just for general knowledge. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, the, the system was built using COBOL code. It's another thing to say, and there's somebody who actually knows how it was designed. Because they also have to understand mm -hmm. how unemployment insurance works. Mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't just pull a COBOL coder off the street and say, now do all these things with the system. Um, 
the only other thing I wanted to touch on, uh, and we can keep going, uh, I know we've got a few more minutes, oh, but when we talk about priorities, um, you know, it came up in the legal aid letter, but I just want to articulate here on the record, you know, um, equal opportunity, accessibility, um, equity, non-discrimination, those have been priorities for the department um, even prior to the pandemic. Um, we are looking at a number of different ways. That we've made great strides in our workforce development division um, to ensure we're meeting all those marks. Um, our focus it has been on, but is also turning towards unemployment insurance to say, how are we ensuring that um, we are doing everything we can to ensure that um, we're providing our, our UI services in an equitable and accessible way. Um, the department um, has developed a new um, position called an uh, equal opportunity and accessibility manager, which we're actually in the process of recruiting for right now and hiring. So again, that um, a lot of the things that were articulated in uh, the legal aid letter uh, will actually be the responsibility of this individual. Um, we are one of the only states that doesn't have a dedicated um, EO manager. So that was a, an initiative we started talking about um, early on. It's just, again, when the pandemic hit, kind of, there's the requirement, the things you have to do, the things you'd like to do. Um, and this falls probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and so we've been moving that process forward. We've also had a lot of turnover in the department. So, um, you know, we were working on a communications plan uh, in UI for um, making sure we're not only offering the services, but making sure this, the claimants and individuals are aware that the services exist. So part of it is offering the services. The rest is um, also making sure there's enough awareness out there. So we're, we have a communications plan underway. Um, our communications, uh, coordinator uh, actually left and took another job. So we're in a uh, search for a new communications coordinator, um, actually a couple uh, wanting workforce development as well. So um, there's, just so you know, th those remain and are going, are also top priorities for us in this year uh, and we'll be um, focusing heavily on those. We would like to meet that person yeah. when they're hired, I think it's before May. Yeah. As I Sure. From what I'm hearing you say, I mean, it's, it's not an afterthought. Who, yeah. who, the people entering the workforce, the demographics are, you know, foreign born, people of color, people who want a safe, diverse workplace. So I'm glad to hear that's a priority. I, I'd also highlight too, there's specific money that all states got. They have to apply for them, but as long as the uh, application is approved, we're, we went through one round of application, we're going through another one with the federal government for an equity grant. So some of that money will go towards um, general equity work in UI, um, but also um, any um, enhancements to our um, new system to make it more accessible and, and equitable. Um, there's also uh, some additional focuses um, just across the entire department around um, equity and accessibility. That's great. Yeah. No. Just a little question. Um, do you or can you do exit interviews or are exit interviews done in for our state? staff for yeah as, as, as so, many people as you could collect, yeah so we right? that would be good data. so one of the other priorities I, it's actually the next one on the list was um, within the department we've also set out and embarked on a mission of um, improving the overall culture uh, within the department um, and we established a new um, purpose statement and principles um, and uh, so part of that process, we're doing not only exit, in, it, some, we can't do exit, intensive exit interviews for everybody, especially right now because the turnover is so high, but we offer some um, direct exit interviews, but they all, all departing staff um, also receive uh, a link to an exit interview survey that they can take. Um, and then we also started for new staff, what we're calling stay interviews, um, where members of our senior leadership team are actually uh, anybody that's within the first 90 to uh, 120 days um, are receiving, uh, having a one-on-one -on -one interview with a member of the senior leadership team that's not their director. Um, and so they are, you know, just asking them, how's it going? Do you have all the tools you need? Do you have, are you getting the um, direction you need? Um, again, part of, the, part of the leaky bucket is we have people who are leaving and trying to uh, snag it. The turnover that we're you, seeing. Just to tag on to that, because I was going to ask you, how's morale? Yeah. How's, 
because you had a real morale challenge. It, the morale is yeah. So morale across the state, um, based mm -hmm. on the most engage the most employee uh, recent employee engagement survey is low in the department. It's extremely low. Yeah. Um, I think we are. Um, the pandemic may be over, but the crushing factors that came with that have not subsided. So with a high vacancy rate, uh, an extreme number of um, audits that are going on. I mean, I think in the past year, Cam, how many audits have we gone through, would you say? In the past two years for unemployment insurance, I'd say we've gone through at least 10. Um, intensive audits. Um, and those yeah. are initiated by whom? Uh, anywhere from the required state audits, the auditor's office, or the federal uh, government. Um, so like just in the last two weeks, we launched one audit and we got a request from the Office of Inspector General at USDA Law Firm to launch another audit. So again, it's like every every month or so we're getting new audit requests. Um, Are any of those audits related to improper payments or fraud? Most of the audits that we have had with the Office of Inspector General and with USDOL are either directly related to fraud or have a fraud component. Yes, sir. And do you at this point have a number uh, through the most recent year for which you have statistics of the amount of improper payments or the amount of fraud in dollars? I have information that I can share. <laughs> uh, I can take up your last six minutes with it. Um, it is a yeah. very in-depth conversation. Yes. We could also share it by memo and then have a follow-up. Probably given the time that we have, sharing by memo at least is a first step. But yep. that's an important piece. We've had discussions before yep. about the issue, and I know the last time that we talked particularly about fraud uh, that was related to that big blip that caused you to shut down, the department did not have any numbers, was not able yeah. to quantify to us where that stood. Yeah, so we yeah. also looked at the issue of improper fraud over time, and it was something like a $55 million amount over a 10-year period that was a concern that we talked about about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And I'd like to know where that uh, has evolved since the end of that particular period as to what the trend is. Uh, we had some consulting work done focused on that entire issue, and. Uh, debate on the quality of that work, that's another issue, uh, as to, well, what's happened since then? And are we improving in terms of the proper payments and the identification of fraud? That's just what particular concern to me. Yes, sir, and we can yeah. pull together some detailed information and share. I will tell you that um, we are seeing continued significant improvement in that area. Just um, for general knowledge, so, there are a couple of different types of fraud that you'll hear us talk about. One is um, claimant fraud, which is um, an intentional act by a claimant to misrepresent a material fact in order to obtain benefits. So they might not report wages that they earned in order to receive benefits on top of the wages they earned. Um, the big one that we all are familiar with, I think, over the last year is identity theft fraud. So stolen identities from some other um, data breach not related to the department. So again, you know, Equifax had a large data breach. A lot of that data ended up uh, on the black market and was used by um, uh, what we call bad actors um, to file for benefits in a number of states. And then um, there's some uh, additional um, components of fraud. You'll hear the term improper payments. Improper payments does not always directly relate to fraud because improper payments could be that, again, we just improperly paid somebody based on, you know, it, they weren't doing it maliciously, right? Like more information came, yeah, more information came to light or, you know, something happened within the department where we issued a determination, that determination got reversed on appeal. Um, you know, so it, improper payments can be overpayments of benefits or underpayments. Of benefits. Um, so again, just you know, we'll cover all of those, I think, uh, and, and try to articulate that. Well, I was very insulted that you turned down my claim <laughs> for my two weeks of work in the Alaskan fish. Pack. I heard about that. I heard about that. Um, you know, for, I think you should pay me. <laughs> and just for those listening at home, that was. That was well, not an actual fraud experience. It, but no, I was more concerned that whoever filed it had my social security right. number and my birth date. And there's all kinds of things yeah. on every 
one <laughs> fly back. Yeah. Make it count. It's well, and, and no, I mean, that's a pain in the neck. I mean, so you're all aware. I mean, former Governor Howard Dean filed for benefits ten times uh, under oh, wow. <laughs> under ten different Social Security numbers, but yes. use the same name, yeah. right? I mean, again, that's it not was you, know, out there. you know that was fraud. But <laughs> um, you know, the harder part is probably ensuring people that the these the, their information is getting used to file for benefits and we're catching probably 99 percent of it right now um, because we're literally going through and auditing each claim um, and we have a whole fraud team which we've never had before um, but um, in in most cases there's a concern that the data is coming from us right so that they believe that our data is getting leaked out there and that's how people are filing for benefits and we have to reassure them that you know there's been no data breach at the department of labor right this is just somebody using your social your date of birth your mother's maiden name and all of that history that's out there um, to file probably not just with us right they're probably filing in in 50 other states but that also is an issue regarding the data modernization yeah. because yeah. one of the issues of data modernization is to build in tools yeah. to catch these kinds of right. things that would go through otherwise in our antiquated Yeah, system. so it's it's tools to catch it when it gets in there. It's um, tools like multi-factor authentication yeah. when you're logging in to secure the system. Um, so you're absolutely, absolutely right. So we have three minutes left and, I, and then we'll be cutting into our, our break, but you might also have somewhere to be um, we want to have you back, I think. <laughs> um, and I guess the question is, is there anything you wanted to preview? Is there any time period where you thought it would be good to come back because you'll have a response to something or new data? Matt, of course, you know, and both of you, I mean, we just didn't give you the opportunity to share report backs, things like that. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm assuming you want us back and maybe Sarah to talk about workforce development yes. initiatives. Oh, and you why. And, and you trust are. Yeah. I mean, I understand our added benefit of $60 a week for all plans okay. as kick, just highest. Just right? maximum. Yes, just maximum. So it's gone up. It would have gone to 608 and it's gone to 668 as a result. It was at 583. Great. So that has actually happened, which would be nice. It was nice to finally learn that. Um, the, I, we need an update on that. We need an update on um, aspects around it and on um, the trust fund and uh, and Matt's data, uh, <laughs> uh, which we'd love to hear, which puts us all in such a good picture where we are. I was just gonna add, um, so Matt's team um, will, he calls it going dark, but essentially for two months in um, February and March, they essentially look back over the, la the last um, calendar year and true up all that data. So that may be a good time, uh, sometime either within that or at the end of that, to have them come back to look at the last year right. in review. Um, we also have the trust fund report that will be coming out. So that may be a good time to have us back to talk about the UI trust. Is that in mid-January? Is that after? The report itself is due the 31st. Okay. Yep. So maybe first week of February. Is that too ambitious? Second week? Okay. So Perfect. first week of February, we'll have you all back in the in the chair. Did you want to just make the fourth on that piece? Well, that's probably when we'll really open up the workforce development and labor chapter because housing is going to be Well, and housing is going to No, 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 I realize. But just on the UI piece, because um, there's another piece on UI, the other COVID uh, piece. Yes. PUA. Yeah, right. PUA? Yes. Do yes. we need updates on that? I pretty much do not know. Pandemic unemployment assistance. So it was one of the. Which was the huge. The he fun took one. up a huge yeah. piece of our time. <laughs> yeah. over the last was, uh, so that's the one even people who yeah, so it, again, it was the most flexible of the federal programs. Okay. It essentially said if you were self-employed or an independent contractor, or if you could not work um, because of a COVID-related reason, um, you could receive benefits through that. Okay. So I'm going to ask over this month, Senator Clarkson, if you could be working with our DOL partners to figure <laughs> out what else we do need to hear as a committee. Yeah. I think that'll still be the first week of February, but you can make sure we get everything we need. And we're asking for it. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure I can get everything we need from DOL, but I don't know what We will do our best. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Cameron, congratulations on your new title yeah. and role. Sounds additive, but we're- Ditto to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
during one of my stints in here, Cameron was our legal counsel. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Watch counsel. I'm fine. Sorry to get it. Grateful to have more of your partnership. Yet another example. We train them and the departments and agencies. <laughs> Still. That's a